Hello everyone. Welcome to Alt Shift Studio. My name is Sabi Ahmed and I'm the Associate Director and Curator of Vishara Art Foundation. In today's episode of Alt Shift Studio, we're with artist Abdul Halik Aziz. Halik is a visual artist based in Colombo in Sri Lanka. He approaches art making by reappropriating and mixing images already in the physical and electronic public realms. Halik has worked as a journalist and economist and in the public development sector. He holds an MA in linguistics from the University of Granada. He's part of the Packet Collective and runs a widely followed Instagram account called Columbeduin. Halik was part of the Shard Foundation's second exhibition titled Bodybuilding that was curated by Nata Raza and took place from September to December in 2019. Our conversation with him in preparation for this episode really pushed us to questioning whether a studio is even necessary in order to be a contemporary artist. Halik will be making a presentation for around 20 minutes, followed by a Q&A with me and my colleague Laura Metzler. We hope you're going to enjoy the session. Over to you, Halik. My name is Abdul Halik Aziz and I'm a visual artist based in Colombo, Sri Lanka. And in this talk, I'll give you a brief introduction into the kind of work that I do and talk a little bit about the infrastructures and processes that go into its making. Uh, a lot of my work is inspired by the current phase of modernization and development in Sri Lanka. The country is in a phase of acceleration and this is creating a rhizome of interrelated phenomena which I in many ways feel in the middle of. A while ago I started thinking about and responding to this quote by Gramsci. This has led me down a journey of attempting just such an inventory through a collection of documents, images and writings pertaining to the self. More recently, this has seen me digging into my family's history through old photographs and oral narratives. This work also speaks to me in tracing the religious and cultural transformations of the Muslims of Sri Lanka, a minority community which I belong to, within an increasingly nationalist post-war state that is positioning Muslims as a new other in the post-war climate and refusing to reconcile uh, with his conflict-driven past. So the, the Nalapiti, there were three sisters, it seems. Yeah. Three sisters. I love Oru sister, very Pandavi. This is coupled with an interest in Colombo, uh, which has been transforming uh, since the end of the war in 2009, itself becoming a locus of conflict and change. Micro signifiers that speak to the macro, which I discover largely through encounters while on walks in the city, to me feel like Freudian slips, which unearth the hidden language of the city, which almost acts like a sentient being, a mimic which ironically mirrors the human aspirations placed on it, suppressing it, forming it, attempting to give language and fixity to what might before have been diffuse and open, or simply just different landscapes. Meanwhile, the tourism industry has become the post child of Sri Lanka, projecting it as a desirable landscape, not only for image obsessed Instagram influencers, but also big capital. Tourism photography on Instagram forms a distinct language, which both reflects globalized travel photography tropes, as well as orientalist notions of the exotic. I became interested in the recurrent iconography of this visual culture and what it speaks to as well as in how it might begin to transform the material world, spatially, culturally and economically. So, my archive is diffuse and encompasses a multiplicity of subject areas and information flows. My various projects, which I go back and forth between, become themselves clouds of output, which draw from each other, as well as from the clouds of constant streams of information flowing in the world around me. Hey yo, Sri Lankan check! Uh, a common thread is an interest in processes of deterritorialization as a result of an accelerated visual culture. Often I will find myself reproducing these processes in my work, engaging with the lack of fixity and the resistance to order and narrative. Ayo, Sri Lankan check. Similarly, it becomes difficult to fix the concept of a studio as a concrete space or set of processes. The infrastructures I use to make work follow a more kinetic model, 
where instruments, spaces, and experiences function as infrastructures of creation as and when they need to. Since my process isn't fixed to a particular location or space, the idea of a studio is something that constantly shifts. What my studio at any given time is, is highly contingent on what I am working on and where I am. And its boundaries are always blurring that it crosses over into archives, instruments, research, exhibition spaces, and even experiences. That being said, I split my time living between the apartment I share with two friends and my parents' space. These spaces are where I largely do much of my research and thinking, and also where I keep my physical archives and equipment. My parents' house is where much of my longer-term storage is. These, as well as other areas I travel to, become my studios in terms of physical structures. But much of the infrastructure I use to create is digital, virtual, and portable. A project always begins with a question, or a space where a question should be. I start to flesh out questions or the space left in their absence by beginning a process of collection. This is a slow process which can take months or years to gain momentum. It often happens in the background and its main methodology is the process of uh, swimming, immersion in data streams, information, reading, immersion in spaces, in communities. It slowly begins to gather an archive in the wake of all this. In a backlog of ideas and what ifs stored in notebooks, digital notepads, apps, snippets of text, screenshots, learnings from conversations, other works of art that speak to me and inspire me, etc. Walks in the city in others and, and in other spaces help me connect with the desiring production of the urban landscape. The surge of life and intent within its elements that cannot be contained, framed and or reduced. Lately, I have been collecting visuals and field recordings and experimenting with uncouplings and recouplings of the sonic and the visuals. I do this through first creating soundscapes on Ableton where I experiment with cacophony making, combining beats and samples with field recordings, etc. And then by pulling from my archives to mix and match sounds with images and visuals, uh, depending on what I want to achieve. As I collect and immerse myself, I also test this content online. I constantly publish bits and pieces. My main outlet is Instagram. It, it allows me to begin to form languages of expression through experimentation. I compose and release, connected to a subconscious ordering of the cloud around me to give shape to my thoughts, give them form. These little forms then help me build capacity to form larger ones, eventually making more concerted works from them. Instagram also becomes a visual journal of sorts. Uh, in the midst of all this, physical objects, archives, uh, photographs and texts, um, stickers and other paraphernalia I collect on my travels, uh, I store either in my flat or at my parents' house. In the beginning of my process, I start by reading texts to absorb context and theoretical frameworks to experiment. I read both digitally and physically, from a physical library and a library on my Kindle, PDFs on my computer, etc. I use Zotero to organize my reading and to build bibliographies and reading lists. 
I use tools like Arena to organize my research and connect its various strengths. Arena also is a great way to compile mood board style layouts, which help me combine material and think about form and aesthetics. I constantly write and journal to process information streams, both digitally and through analog means. My writing and journals also form a central locus of collection for ideas and simply sometimes just dumping up thoughts. I also like to collect dreams that I've had which I can remember. I think dreams are a space where a lot of associations and mixing happens, and I'm intrigued by the implications of the amalgamations they produce. Walter Benjamin said that copying out a text as opposed to merely reading it modifies our soul and reveals hidden aspects of our inner self. For me, copying out a text definitely helps to connect with what I read and to remember it better. I use Ulysses as a space for making notes and literature reviews. Um, as Jagat Virasinghe, a senior artist, once advised me, uh, I try to adopt an attitude of an always already present understanding in reading critical texts and to try to think less about what texts could objectively mean and instead try to dwell on how they produce meanings with the unverbalized ideas and observations of my ongoing processes of connection. My desk, whether it's at my flat or at my parents' house, is where I do most of my research and processing. My fascination with sticker culture in other cities I visited led me to thinking about stickers as a way of intervening and detuning urban spaces. Um, and now I make and distribute stickers of my own, creating iconography to add to that uh, which is existing in the streets. Um, in stickering, I look for pre-existing juxtapositions to intervene into through stickers. Uh, found installations or situations which I can then go and add stickers to. Uh, in that sense, the streets to me is very much becomes a site of installation and experimentation. Much of my archiving happens through my phone, where I store images, voice recordings and sometimes writing. It becomes a space to which I constantly turn uh, to process content from, to collect content through and to create new mixers. As I start engaging with the content more concertedly, I transfer my archive to my laptop. And here I have it organized on my external hard drives by date and location. Though that doesn't always help when I'm trying to collect images outside of those categories, which is almost all the time. No archiving system is ever going to complete you. And I really find that a lot of my organizing actually happens through memory and mental mind maps. More courage in playing with mixing and random connections came together in a workshop I did in 2018 at the Tirtha Artists Collective with Shirana Shabazi. We discussed aspects of narrative and coherence and worked on how to connect seemingly disparate symbols and elements asymically and epiphanically. I was particularly inspired by her collaborative book Shehrazad, which was a mashup of snippets of writing, annotations and photographs uh, posing as a historical text, and this influenced subsequent zines I made which mixed together ethnographic observations, images, found images, and writing slash media into a singular space. In late 2018, I traveled to the south of Sri Lanka to live and work in areas wow. where there was widespread tourism. Through my friend Luca, I found work with Philip, who is a Swiss national building an adventure park in the jungle off from the beach. The work involved clearing wilderness and building infrastructure, as well as some copywriting and graphic design. I worked in return for food and lodging. While working, I was also documenting observations and taking images and video for my project. On this picture, you can see a local man presenting his jumping skills. An investigation into visual culture around tourism in Sri Lanka. This eventually resulted in a zine which mixed together my field observations, online research, and detailed notes. Often the site of installation itself will function as a studio space for me. Installations always come together within the space. What usually happens is that I go to the space with the collection of material that I have gathered in the process of research. And once I come to the space, I think about how exactly to present them. Working from conceptualizations I might have thought of before, the piece slowly comes together after some on-site experimentation and adaptation. Some months later, I visited the Verzaska Valley in Switzerland for a residency with the Verzaska Photo Festival through Pro Helvetia New Delhi. Um, as of late, 
Wizaska has seen a major spike in tourism and has been called the Maldives of Europe, mainly due to the azure color of the waters of its rivers. I spent a number of weeks walking around its vast spaces, trying to get a feel for its landscape and people, and in an experiment in seeing, attempted to make connections between Wazaska's exoticization and temporal shifts and that of Sri Lanka's. I started making zines in 2018. To me, they are a democratic way of producing and distributing art, and also a fun way of engaging with different flows of information. Much of my zine making is done in InDesign. Sometimes they are customized physically. Most of the time I produce zines that work with larger installations or art projects. The printing usually takes place via one of the printing presses I work with in the city. The practical effects of technology in use on visuals and media can often inspire ways to treat work. Uh, memory, for instance, was inspired after I noticed interesting visual relationships between images from a bulk download of my iPhone from the first half of 2016. These relationships began to form as I clicked through them rapidly. They spoke not only to interrelationships between the spaces I've been to and methods of documenting, but also to a diaristic narrative of sorts of my life and work in that time period. The development of photo animations through exercises in Photoshop, which I started working with at the Chennai Photo Biennale residency in 2019, uh, began as, as a process of making collages. And when I realized that the actual act of moving, cutting and shifting that happens was itself interesting. This led me to begin to imagine these as films, and I proceeded to start to record my screen to capture them. Eventually, I purchased and started using a Wacom tablet for better collaging and detouring. About a year ago, I came together with a group of fellow artists and friends to form a community of support and collective practice. Our first project together was The Packet, a deconstructed art book which is currently in the process of going to print. The Packet as a collective consists of myself, Sandev Handy, Sharika Navamani, Venuri Pereira, Dinal Kalyanage, Imad Majid, S.P. Pushpakantan, and Cassie Machado. We create work discursively through conversation and thinking in public, and so the community itself then becomes a space for production. Um, and since all of us aren't always together in the same space, we use tools like email or video conferencing to come together. Alec, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, you're the last presenter of our first set of artists that we want to do Portrait Studio with. And it's been so interesting to see that whereas the very base material of your practice is often low res footage of things, is often uh, a mix of different media capturing uh, devices that bring your works together, your, your presentation has been the most high res of all. So thank you for putting in all the work in this way and creating the space for the dialogue. What I want to begin before we go into the Q&A is share a little bit of our readings and our conversations around your practice, because I think that becomes very valuable for the questions that we'll hear hereafter. And what I want to begin with is that, uh, as a recap, one thing that emerged as we looked at your works, as you took us through your practice in its most varied sort of forms is that you're almost like a like a dj you're mixing the audio visual landscapes and all the references uh, that surround us and especially coming from you i think it brings our attention to the context of of um uh, of sri lanka where you as as you yourself have described your practice to emerge out of a post-war kind of a, of a milieu where, if I may say, there is a kind of uh, working very closely with debris and very closely with kind of fractured histories and fractured realities. And um, what comes very powerfully is that you're obviously bringing all of these together to, to, to make sense of them and to stitch them together in some form of composite realities that we all inhabit. And you're streaming those and that your practice as, as an artist, 
has been challenging for us to, to sort of put our finger on the studio because of this constant stream that you're part of and the mixing that you're constantly involved in. And with that, I want to revisit also a conversation that uh, had emerged uh, between Laura, myself, and then with you, which is that in this session, I think we confronted most clearly the difficulty of even defining the studio. And this happened because with at least the three other artists that we've worked with before, Umber Najeev, Rachi Goody, and uh, Ranveer Singh, what, what came about was an initial moment of uh, recognition that the studio is not what we tend to think it is. And whereas there's ambiguity in the beginning, we slowly arrive at a kind of clarity that, oh, yeah, okay, my studio is this, this, and this, and a network of all of these uh, physical and social sites. In your case, over the number of meetings that we've had, what we found that was that it only became more and more ambiguous. More, you became more and more hesitant to try and be more def definitive about your studio. And it led us, of course, to think about whether you are in art, your practice compels us to think that maybe the studio isn't even a prerequisite for an artist. That is it, and you put, you put it across quite nicely in a, in a comment the other day that uh, you have been quite unsure whether it is necessary to have a studio if you're, if you're a contemporary artist. Obviously your presentation arrived at other conclusions, uh, provisional ones as they may be. So um, I think this has been a, at least a very big kind of revealing sort of moment for me to start thinking that, yeah, is it even important that, that we have to pin down on a studio? And I don't know if Laura and Alec, you, either of you would have anything to respond to. I know the conversations have already happened and you made your presentation, but if you wanted to bring something of that up, I think it would be, it would be um, quite valuable before we begin Q&A. Um, thanks. Thanks, Abhi, and uh, thank you, Laura. It's been uh, actually a great experience uh, participating and doing this with you because I felt I have learned a lot and uh, it's been very challenging for me as well to break down and think about my practice and uh, to sort of like verbalize and articulate how I do what I do. Uh, and all the sort of like challenging questions you've asked me and all the discussions that we've had that have been going back and forth is, you know, sort of, sort of maybe broken me out of a sense of complacency when it comes to being really aware of like why I do what I do in, in a certain sense. So it's been really interesting to kind of like turn this scrutiny on like the things that I sort of take for granted and perform very instinctively uh, in my practice. Um, but yeah, as, as I sort of like brought up a while ago as well, I guess I never really had this sort of like ontological category of a studio in sort of like my vocabulary um, when speaking about what I do. And so I've been quite sort of like, I've been asked to kind of like do studio visits before and mostly it's just been me taking my laptop and my phone and kind of like maybe a bunch of zines and like showing people what I've done, my work. But in terms of actually thinking about the studio in terms of where I situate myself and create, it's always been, I guess, a very diffuse kind of space. And I felt like I really latched on to words like infrastructure and processes more than uh, a, st a studio. And I feel like that was sort of like much more helpful for me to think through um, an actual doing uh, and, and sort of like uh, a doing that is not necessarily spatially located, but maybe more, more, more disparated as you I uh, described it, uh, Laura and Ansabi as well, kinetic in a sense of uh, switching on and a switching off happening. So uh, one thing like my phone, for example, at one point might um, become a studio and at another point might not be a studio. And then I feel like um, wherever I go, I tend to sort of like make little studios in a sense of like where I am right now, for example. Um, yeah. <laughs> And I mean, like we had also talked about, like there's an element of speed that comes that's in your practice and in like also the idea of how you work. And that also tends to be kind of a little counterintuitive to how we think of the studio. Um, like we tend to think of the studio as a place of like processing and production and like thinking through 
Um, but I mean, what, one of the challenging things has been like you think through and process, you know, rapidly shifting, collecting information, these like really overwhelming, you, like you described it as clouds or data streams. And so I think that was something that was interesting. Maybe we can also talk about the speed element a little bit. Yeah. In fact, a question that, that comes to my mind often is how much the bandwidth and power cuts affect uh, your practice. But we can pick that up later uh, as, as we talk about more Q&A that we open up. So let's begin with the Q&A on that note. So, um, I mean, kind of jumping off of the speed um, and into the Q&A, uh, your work is very much tied to like rapidly changing media landscapes. Um, and there's been a constant change of technology. And um, so I wanted to kind of see with you what some of the key moments um, where things have shifted. Um, and like one of the ones, like when we were talking about it is you use Arena, which is a very um, particular and kind of niche platform. And I had looked at it myself, but I haven't been able to quite get like a grasp on it. So it was really interesting to, for me to see um, an artist really using it. So. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Laura. So um, I guess, yeah, I, um, technology, I suppose, has been at the sort of like the forefront of uh, me kind of like engaging with the stuff that I engage with, I suppose. Um, I remember I got my first smartphone uh, back in 2011. Uh, but before that, I had like a point and shoot camera, which is what really kind of like helped me start taking photographs. Uh, and that was also around the time that the war sort of ended and it coincided with this moment of getting interested in photography and exploration and also having the ability to kind of explore uh, in a free way in Sri Lanka. Um, and this is what really kind of helped me start, a bit, start taking pictures, but I also really wanted to kind of like put my pictures out. I really felt uh, like I needed to engage with an audience for some reason with the kind of things that I was taking. And at that point in time, there was very kind of few technologies or social networks that you could do this. Um, aside from Flickr and, and platforms like that, which were very kind of like catered towards highly technical, uh, very kind of like an aesthetically sort of like normative kind of like, if I may say so, um, kind of photography. Um, so it wasn't really until Instagram came along that I felt like I had found a space to express the kind of like casualness and, and spontaneity through which I sort of like engage. Uh, with the world around me through images and I feel like that was like pretty much uh, a big breakthrough for me to be able to um, find an audience uh, for the kind of images that I was taking in, in, a, in around the world uh, in, the, in the sort of like the environment that I was in and I feel like there's a sort of like a part of me that needs that constant kind of like feedback and engagement you know this constant need to kind of put something out and maybe write something and feel that there is some sort of receptiveness to it or not and sort of like gauge uh, maybe not the value, but sort of like the uh, the, the semiotic qualities of, of this kind of like things that I'm doing. It's like this space of assessment and a space of kind of like uh, negotiating to producing these things. Um, and I suppose other kind of like things that happened with also the end of Instagram stories, I was able to kind of like um, these the modalities through which I did this. Uh, I did I did use Snapchat a while ago before that to kind of create stories through videos and then with Instagram stories they have all these other kinds of like modalities you could use uh, images in conjunction with videos you could uh, add snippets of text so it's just this ongoing kind of like mashup that was uh, possible you know and um, I feel like this really kind of helps me deal with all the things that I'm absorbing all the time and I feel like I absorb a lot of things and I guess my archives are a testament to how much I absorb because I am like a, a chronic hoarder when it comes to digital content and I have like too much, you know, and I wish I could just like filter these things out, but somehow it's just very difficult to uh, gauge the value of like one image versus another image or a snippet versus another snippet. You know, I always think, oh, I'm going to need this some, at some point. There's always this instrumental value attached to anything I collect. Um, and then more recently, I suppose, getting a more powerful computer really helped expand my kind of like abilities. I really felt like getting into video editing much more seriously, um, Photoshop and things like that. Um, and also, yeah, to touch on why my video is so high risk is because I just kind of very recently got like a full frame SLR, 
um, for some work that I needed it for, and then I've been really kind of enjoying it because uh, I've I've always wished that I could take pictures of high resolution with my phone because I'm always attracted to like little viscera and little details and the things that I'm attracted to just reveal more and more the closer you look at them. And I feel like I wish I could just take a, a massive sort of like a print of one of these images or one of these little things that I take on the street. And I've always wanted to kind of play around with a, a big camera, but it's always been a problem to carry these things around. So whenever I had like a an SLR, it's just been very difficult to take it with me. And I think there's a saying, and I think it's like really true, like the best camera you you can own is the one that you have with you all the time. Um, but like I finally caved and did get myself a, a very light kind of like Sony uh, camera. And that's sort of like been easy to carry around. So I've been like really getting into using it more. So I figured why not, uh, why not just amp it up when I'm just like doing this video with you guys. And, um, I feel like uh, Arena, like you touched on it, was also a very recent thing for me as well. And I also got to know about it through like artist colleagues and friends. Um, and just like you, I mean, the first time I used it, I didn't get it. I, I opened it, opened up an account and then didn't go back to it for like a couple of months until the until actually the pandemic when there was like more time to spend, read and think about things. And I was just getting more and more into reading different things. And I realized that this is a great tool to use. Um, and then I got back into it. And I started reading more about uh, the the organization itself, and it's actually uh, was started by a bunch of independent uh, designers and uh, artists. Uh, and they sort of like the way they've kind of like designed the space is to go against kind of like the normative ethics of uh, a corporate social media platform. So there aren't. Uh, there isn't like a like economy, for example, right? and there isn't like a privileging of sort of content based on like a mob or crowd mentality. So you get to really, I mean, I, I, in that sense, it's far more purist and I feel like much more focused towards like connections and learning and research. That's why I kind of like like it. And yeah, so I've gone gone and gotten myself a pro account, but I don't really know if I'll actually use it to that level, but it, it's been really nice so far. Yeah. <clears throat> I have a connected question to Laura's, which is that uh, among so many friends and colleagues and even artists I know who are now established and at one point were you know, still struggling and doing all kinds of experiments, there was always a component of sharing either a studio space, sharing tools and technologies. And not everyone owned everything, obviously. And so in your case, what has been at least that ecosystem of spaces being shared some of these cameras or tools being shared, was there a moment when that was that was more prominent? And that I suppose that still continues to be, and how does that play out now? Do you lend your camera now that you have one to sometimes other friends? Do you borrow something? Do you guys uh, share spaces whenever you do? I will be asking about your collective next, but maybe you could say a little bit about this, how these things are shared and sometimes a space of a common, sort of room is created. Yeah, of course, I feel like, especially with infrastructure like cameras or, you know, even design skills, for example, there are certain skills and certain kind of like uh, technologies that are either too difficult to obtain or like expensive. And I feel like just make a lot of sense to share, you know? So definitely I'm, I'm like a little sort of like still very attached to my camera, so I don't, I'm usually there when I share it with someone else, uh, not all the time, but uh, I definitely do share it and also like benefit from uh, things that my friends have uh, and technologies, but also, for example, I really sort of like benefit from uh, design skills and layout skills and other kinds of skills that my friends have, you know, and then also things like reading a text and sharing an opinion. I think those sort of like ideational sharing is very important uh, and, and uh, also conversations as well uh, sort of like creating spaces outside of normative kind of like society or sort of like more fixed kind of capitalist notions of thinking is very important I feel like in a city like Lambu so I'm like very grateful to uh, my community for that so in that sense yeah sharing big proponent of it <laughs> understood thank you which then brings me to yeah sorry Oh, I just had one more kind of question going back to like your point and shoot 
camera. Um, so I'm basically looking at this in two directions. One, do you still have the materials from like the early digital cameras that you had, the kind of like point and shoot pre phone cameras, and like do those factor in? And then on the other end, with like social media like development, have you been able to like embrace? You said you mentioned like Snapchat for like a brief period, or like even TikTok. Like Sabi and I had a conversation about how neither of us have been able to really embrace TikTok. <laughs> So I was just intrigued in terms of these like technological shifts. Like that's something that you've also like if each if you've been like trying out these different platforms as well, or are you like a dedicated platform man now? I've been I've been a long time lurker on TikTok actually. I'm I'm fascinated with uh, like that mode of expression and how it's kind of like taken over. It's like memes have become kind of like generalized across the board and all kinds of like expression happening happening through a meme right so tiktok is you just like have a meme and different people kind of like express themselves through that meme and i haven't really had the courage yet to go out and make my own tiktok and i don't know if i'm like now somehow too ossified in like a older way of thinking to do it but i hope i i, I might have the courage to, i get some ideas as to how i can play around with it but big time work on tiktok for sure and uh, very kind of like intrigued uh, especially also, I've been noticing more and more young people kind of like performing TikTok in urban spaces in Colombo, like uh, like in malls, for example, uh, there would be these cliques of young people who would suddenly sort of like start performing in front of a camera. And it's a very kind of like, you, you know, it's, it's a TikTok that's been done. So there's, there's this culture of TikToking that's actually also eaten into real life in, in, in very real ways. So I think it's become really hard to ignore um tiktok <laughs> you know that's right i mean right now um, the the rallies of trump have been uh, impacted by k-pop fans on tiktok who bought tickets and then decided not to attend which then uh, yeah sorry did you have more to add because i was going to ask no about just uh, just about the earlier pictures that i've taken on my point and shoot i actually do do have a lot of them um mm -hmm. but they are very different to the kind of pictures i'm taking now and i feel like that that happens to me i do kind of like shift a lot maybe i've shifted about two th in, about three times in major ways over the last 10 years or so but i i still hold on to them i mean i feel like yeah like i said i'm a, I'm a compulsive hoarder so i mm. i find it really hard to delete anything mm. so it's still it's all there maybe maybe one day i'll find some use for it or it'll be useful mm. i don't know <laughs> mm. yes yes got it which uh brings me to the next question if you can tell us a little bit more about Packard Collective. Um, when you guys performed, what does the collective do? Who are the members of it? Where is the collective based, if at all it's in one location? Well, um, the Packard started, uh, I think, the beginning of 2019, actually. Um, it was mainly based around a group of friends who are also artists. Um, so there's me, there's Sunday Handy, there's Imad Majid, there's uh, Sharika Nawamani. Cassie Machado, Veneri Pereira, Dinal Kalienage, Esti Pushta Kantan. Um, and so we have mostly, we were mostly based around Colombo at, at the time of forming. Uh, Pushta Kantan was in the East Coast. Um, but now Cassie has moved back to London. So, and, and pretty soon, maybe a couple of other farm members would also go abroad. Um, so we did actually start um, meeting up at this apartment that I share with uh, two friends who also in the back of um, before that, it was Venery and Sandev. Now it's Sandev and Ephraim. Um, and mainly, like I said, it was just this, uh, just a way of creating a space and community. Uh, because I feel like, like most big cities, it's very difficult to sustain a life as an artist. I'm not just talking uh, in terms of, like financial aspects of it, because those are very important as well. But also, main, also like ideological aspects. Of it, you know, to be able to have conversations and, and discuss things and be in a space. But there's like a commonality of thought where you feel like um, comfortable. Uh, you know, like um, the Morton and Hani, uh, Morton has this really nice uh, um, concept called the unrecognized politics of the beyond always already in motion. You know, this, this thing that's happening behind the surface that cannot be kind of described and touched upon, but that is kind of like there. And you feel this when you sort of like form communities and you form uh, bonds with like-minded people. Uh, and that was really the main kind of goal to uh, build the packet and also to create a space that uh, not necessarily was built around institutional critique, but maybe institutional release, you know, to speak about what it really meant to to be an artist in Sri Lanka. And then 
what were all these things that were impacting our practice and what were the pressures that we were facing and all the things that we felt in dealing with the art world and, and what that meant to us and to create this sort of like community of, uh, of conversation and, and a safe space. Um, but we also, you know, we also focused on doing projects and creating work. Um, so our initial project was this uh, deconstructed art book, or, or we, we'd like to call it that in a sense. So basically it was a collection of zines and different content uh, put into a, a packet. So we called it the packet and that became the name of the collective. But the very creatives generally sort of like maybe have a broad idea. And then in this case, with the creation of the packet, it was thinking about the questions that we ask ourselves and not necessarily the questions we ask others, you know. Mm. Um, and thinking about being playful and, and sort of responsive to instinct and, and thinking about also creating together. So we basically framed these ideas and then just started talking about them. We just like met up for dinner and drinks at the apartment every once or two, uh, twice a week. We would just talk about it and in the background we would like create things and slowly we would bring our creations together and then they would come together in some, some sort of weird kind of like way. And that's kind of like been a sort of like a more ever since uh, to kind of like build, uh, build, build things through conversation. Um, yeah, and then since, um, since people started moving out away and also since um, the pandemic and everything happened, we found ourselves moving more and more into uh, house party conversations, conversations over email. And they've also been quite productive. Also. So it's, it's been nice to have this group of people to touch base with, you know. Mm. Thank you. So, I mean, following up on the collective, then um, it's interesting because the then the technologies that you're looking at in your own practice um, are often described as somewhat individualistic of kind of the personal view through like Instagram or like whatever your view through your own device is. Um, and then the devices themselves become so personalized too, and like how they're they're utilized, um, organized, what kind of apps you're working with, um, what your your kind of viewpoint is. So can but can you share with us the sort of social life of your practice and the spaces that you're working with in your practice, kind of outside of the collective too? Um, because there is something even if you're even though you're using these really individualized um, you know, systems that this kind of communication process is really key. And you touched on that a little bit before, like wanting to, to interact with an audience, but kind of how things get honed a little bit through this process. Um, I feel like there's a danger to that honing as well as good points. I feel one thing is this whole, uh, the algorithmic kind of like, uh, attitude of Instagram just to privilege certain things over over others and I feel like if you really sort of like get into it it can start to influence the kind of things you do so I'm always conscious of that um, but I feel that there's maybe I'm not really able to properly think about why but there is a sense of something when I uh, put something out onto Instagram and I know that people are seeing it it I guess requires me to uh, take ownership of it in a, in a certain way or to sort of like have a sense of confidence that it kind of quote unquote means something or is significant in some shape or form. And I feel like that kind of, that itself starts shaping my thoughts in a subconscious way. And I feel like doing this, okay, now I'm going to make a story would mean like, okay, there are certain significant things that I'm tapping into. So it, it for me, it becomes also like a filtering mechanism, so like the presence of, of an audience. Uh, um, there's also like constant communication with people who uh, talk to me on direct messages mostly. And I feel like the direct messages become a space of kind of like negotiating, I don't know, meaning of the things that I do, but also just like responding in very casual ways and having these uh, very kind of like casual conversations with friends and other people who, who respond in different ways to um, uh, the things that I post. Um, but I feel there's also like a big social aspect in when it comes to the spaces that I take images from, right? So a lot of them are kind of like urban spaces full of people and like life. And I just really like walking and immersing myself in the city and immersing myself in, in life, uh, in, 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 in lives of communities or like community spaces, social spaces. Um, 
and I feel like there's like a negotiation that happens there as well in terms of like how I move, how I sort of like behave and present myself. And uh, even though I don't really take a lot of pictures of people, there's still my presence in that space to kind of negotiate it. And um, it is always interesting and there's always these ethical quandaries that keep popping up sometimes and when I sort of work. Uh, yeah, so I feel like I also come from background of journalism. Um, and then I feel like journalism can also tend towards being a little extractive sometimes so i'm always self conscious of that um but yeah there's there's a lot of like different uh, aspects of the social um that i that i deal with mm. um in that sense, yeah. do you I, use the geotagging do you i don't yeah. remember yeah you use the geotagging so have you ever also um in like your direct messages had like conversations with people who just through the geotagging found your photos and were like we're trying to figure out what was kind of going on or because there ever um, been like also sort of like a confrontational like conversation at any point I don't know yeah I feel like there have been a few confrontational conversations um like I can be very kind of like sometimes like recently I was having a conversation on whatsapp with someone who was selling chicken wings, basically. It was just like this advertisement that I saw and I messaged them and, hey, how much are chicken wings? And they said the chicken wings were like 80 rupees. I don't know, what, like 200 rupees for barbecued chicken wings. But then I was like, you can buy a, a chicken wing that's not marinated for 75 rupees in the supermarket. So why? So it was just this, just this back and forth conversation that I was having with this person about why, trying to just gauge uh, the, the, the price disparity, you know, and I found the conversation really interesting because for me, it's just, it strikes a note with kind of the contemporaneity of Sri Lanka right now where food deliveries are a major thing and kind of like just this aspiration of food culture in, in Colombo. So I just reproduced this conversation on my Instagram um, feed and then it turned out that the, peop the person who was actually, you know, who owns this business was also like uh, one of my followers or knew, knew me or one of their friends knew me. So it kind of went back to that person. So there was this kind of like feedback loop and I had to kind of like explain to them that I didn't really mean, mean anything um, bad with, with my conversation. I was just like finding this very interesting. So I just decided to reproduce it, you know, and I don't really, sometimes I aren't really able to articulate why it's interesting. Sometimes it just speaks to me in a certain way. So I just like talk about it. So I guess not, not really geotagging, but it does kind of like, I do get into thorny situations now and then, but not really all the time. Mostly I kind of like stay out of trouble, I think. Thank you. Um, Halek, we, we have one set question that we ask every presenter in All Shift Studio, and that's usually the last question, which is that what is your studio at this current moment? Um, at this current moment, I am at my auntie's place in Nawalapiti, which is my hometown, you know, and this is this space is my uncle's library, Kum study. And uh, yeah, he's got a lot of books and he's also got like a ton of very interesting archives, like uh, magazines from the 70s. He's like chopped up and put into different collections. So it's like a fascinating place. And I just find it's like great energy in this uh, room. So I kind of appropriated it a little bit uh, here and there for, for my work. But generally, I, 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 I like working from here as well because I'm also really interested right now in, you know, like my family history because my grandma, she's She's really old and uh, I'm really very attached to her. So we keep coming back to see her a lot. And uh, it's, it's um, space that's very close to me because I was born here. And whenever I'm here, I just feel very connected with my sort of like culture and identity. So I feel like it becomes a very enriching space for me to work and think and read. Um, and also just feel very much at peace. Um, yeah, so right now I've not been doing a lot of uh, Art, art creation, I suppose, but I've been doing a fair bit of reading and uh, uh, video editing and things like that here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Halek, you were, as I mentioned earlier, the fourth artist in the in this uh, series of Old Shift Studio that, that we began uh, last month. Uh, we're planning to do more uh, sessions with other artists that we've worked with. But it's been an absolute delight being in conversation with you. I think there's been so much to take away, and you, your practice really posed a challenge to us as to how to think about the studio 
primarily because your practice is so much about streaming, mixing, high velocities, and and materials that that just come together and juxtapose themselves in all sorts of spaces. It's not even you bringing them all into one place to mix them yourself. And so I think a, a big takeaway is that how do we think of space through these processes of streaming? And since we've been discussing the notion of the studio here, it makes us think of what if the studio is a space for streaming and that every place you go, you find different modalities, and configurations of material to create new streams, to create new mixes that play out. So on that note, thank you very much. Um, we hope you continue this dialogue and uh, all the very best for your practice. Thank you guys. Thank you both. And I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing what you guys do in the future with this uh, series as well. Um, yeah, so yeah, once again, thanks so much. It's been really sort of educational for me as well. Mm. We've been touching. Thank you. Bye.